One of the most significant human efforts is aspiration to morality. Our inner stability and even existence is regulated by it. It is the morality of our deeds that adds beauty and dignity to our life. Albert Einstein Time is everlasting, but life is a blink of an eye. It passes and becomes history. We leave our deeds and works, our evil and goodness. An old Eastern truth says, everything in life is afraid of time. Time, this mighty power that ruins civilizations, cultures and nations, has not destroyed the evidence of the ancient nation's existence, these cuneiform records. Different human histories and fates are told in these age-old stones. Historical Armenia, Western Armenia, a territory of present Turkey. Biblical land where the four rivers that would spring from the Lord's paradise and the flowery field of Birakan have not been dried up yet. Lake Von, cradle of civilization. It was called Salt Lake in Assyrian inscriptions. The oldest god in the Armenian pantheon, Areg, every night with his replendants, race rested in the lake of Van. His gorgeous bed was placed on the bottom. The water maids, with their tender songs, sweetened the tired luminary's sleep.
City of Fun, Dushba Van Dosp, City of Semiramis. There was a city, I will say Eden, you may say paradise, with thousands of inhabitants who loved their homelands, soil and water, monasteries and monuments. Van is not far from the lake. The ancient city expands as a fabulous green-haired beauty as an unreal fable over which a huge sun glitters, rolls over on itself, then gets furious and pours out its ardent energy and solar passion. The world leaves and Vaughn continues. It's in the cuneiforms, the speechless symbols of the oldest Urartian fortress of Vaughan, we find information about the ancient neighboring country Assyria. This land and this lake enshrine a number of tales and legends that, having been transferred from older generations, have reached our time. These legends are full of knighthood and heroism, where goodness always triumphs over evil. Alas, only in legends. In legends we meet two neighboring people that have shared the same fate. This rock takes its name from Semiramis. It's preserved in the wrinkles of the nation's memory. According to legend, the Syrian queen Semiramis, fleeing from the soldiers who were chasing her, reached Lake Van, where she threw her magic necklace into the waters of the lake and turned it herself into a rock. Mofsis Horenazi, the father of Romanian history, mentioned that a great number of Assyrian immigrants lived in the territories of Vaspurakan and Korjaik, and that the Romanian prince Sambat Bagratuni's wife was one of them. A considerable part of early medieval Syria, or Asorik as it's known in the Romanian language, now is in the territory of present-day Turkey. In the Middle Ages, Assyrians were also known as Syrians Aramians. Christianity in Syria in the first century was widely developed. Syrian preachers spread the Christian faith throughout the world. The medieval spiritual educational centers of Syria like Ides, Nisibin or Antioch were in this region. Beginning in early medieval times, the heads and prominent representatives of the Syriac Church promoted Christian ritual life. Christian mentality and the 4th century ascetic movement. Various monasteries and hermitages prospered in Syria during this time. 
Over the early Middle Ages, the Syrians and their culture greatly contributed to the world history. Historical Syria was one of the most significant centers of Christianity. The reason for it was not Syria's nearness to Jerusalem, but the two important and celebrated centers, Antioch and Edessa, that Syria had created over time. They played an enormous role in Christian belief, liturgy and mentality, particularly in the first centuries of Christianity. The Syrian church backgrounds date back to Jesus Christ. According to an Assyrian legend, the king of Edessa, Abgar, sent his special delegation to Christ, asking him to come on his own or send one of his disciples to cure him from a disease. The relations between the Assyrian and Armenian churches have had historical, ritual and cultural reasons. Grigory the Illuminator, who was the first Christian patriarch of Armenia, had close relations among the prominent leaders and preachers of the Assyrian church. The patriarch Saint Jacob of Nisibin was one of them. His educational and preaching activities and works were so widely accepted in Armenia that he was considered an Armenian saint. Jacob of Nisibin was both a Syrian and Armenian saint. His decent, wonderful personality, his life mixed with our lives and his presence was so precious for Armenians that he, in fact, was accepted as an Armenian saint. That is how the world Christian people felt at that time, when there were no Christian and cultural divisions. Devotion to the same church, belief in the same Lord and carrying out the same mission stressed their unification rather than differences. A theological controversy arose in the 4th, 6th centuries in the East. It was of political and social character and gradually brought about the Nestorial movement. It also led to another stronger movement, monophysitism, as a disproof of Nestorianism. Later the churches and the predominantly Syrian descendants of the two movements were named after their religious leaders Nestorians and Jacobites, respectively. Today the Nestorian Church is known as Holy Apostolic Catholic Assyrian Church of the East, the Jacobites are called Syrian Orthodox Church of Antioch. Historical Tirebdin. The geographic borders of historical Tirebdin region were originally much larger than today. Its western part expands to Mardin and the eastern part to the borders of Jezero or Jaziret. The names of different regions here are mainly of Assyrian origins. Many of them are still used today. The famous Syrian historical, cultural and spiritual centers are in this region. In ancient time, these monasteries and abbeys, situated away from populated regions, gathered a huge crowd of pilgrims. Avoiding the world's chaos and disorder, the hermit sought his refuge here and devoted himself to the Lord's service. Those monasteries are named after the saints who martyred themselves for the cross and their beliefs.
more Gabriel Monastery. This magnificent 4th century shrine has the honor of being called one of the oldest and most famous functioning spiritual centers in a world where Christian culture flourished over 16 centuries since its foundation. It was also an important center of asceticism, writing and literature of the Syriac Orthodox Church. It greatly contributed to the maintenance of the Assyrian language, ecclesiastical traditions and liturgy. Many valuable manuscripts were written here. More Gabriel Monastery is the seat of the Metropolitan of the Turabdin of the Syriac Orthodox Church. Mediat. The city of Mediat in Turabdin region is often identified with the ancient Matiat, cited in the Assyrian cuneiform writings. It is in the province of Mardin of the Diyarbakir Vilayet, across the right bank of the Tigris River's stream. The population of Mediat was mainly Christian, as proved by a series of Christian churches proudly erected in Mediat. According to a Syrian Catholic priest who visited Mediat in 1913, the population of the city at that time was 6,000 to 7,000, while Domilov, a Russian colonel, estimated at 10,000. The majority of them were Syrian Orthodox. There were also 80 Protestants, 30 Syrian Catholics and some Chaldeans. The road leads us to the miraculous country of our ancestors, the country of our dreams. The city of Mardin lies on a steep hillside in the Mardin Mountains, where the eastern and western cultures are harmoniously intermingled. Built on the mountain precipice, Mardin is rich in squares, bathhouses, inns, churches and mosques. By the 20th century, the city had nearly 14,000 Assyrians and 8,000 Armenians. 
The rest of the population consisted of Arabs, Turks and Kurds. We felt unspeakable joy each time we found the cross bearing domes of the old Syriac churches and monasteries nestled between the grandiose houses and modern buildings. During the time the Syrian families lived in this quarter. They came to this church and attended this parish school preserving their language and belief. It seems as nothing has changed here. Stand-up churches remain and services are carrying out by the local clergymen, though their flock has been diminished. There is a lack of Assyrian breath in this city. A bit far from Mardin is the monastery of Deir al Zafran. Another early medieval masterpiece. Walls of the shrine are covered with variety records. Like other monasteries here, Dera Zafran has preserved the national relics. Spiritual treasures of our ancestors. At one time, this shrine was the seat of the Antioch Syrian Orthodox Church. In the end of the 19th century and the beginning of 20th century, the Assyrians were spread over the Asian part of the Ottoman Empire, in the vilayets or states of Van, Bitlis, Harbert, Diyarbakir and Sebastia. From a religious aspect, they were distributed into three main groups – Nestorians, Catholic Chaldeans and Jacobites, or simply Orthodox. There were also Chaldeans living in the territory of the Ottoman Empire. 
The title Chaldeans was applied by the Rome Catholic Church to the Assyrians converted to Catholicism and joined the Catholic Church as Uniates. In the middle of the 16th century, they founded their new church that was subject to Vatican. Although the Uniate churches acknowledged the supremacy of the Pope, they retained their own language, rights and constitution. The descendants of this church were called Assyro-Chaldeans. They had large communities in Diyarbakir Vilayet, in the city of Siyurt, of the Bitlis Vilayet and in other districts of the Ottoman Empire. It's hopeless to come across even a simple sign of the Chaldean church today in Diyarbakir, for the church has been destroyed and another building has been established on its base quite differing from a church. To historical resources, the Chaldean churches of Amid or Diyarbakir, Mardin and Siyurt were all bishopics. Diyarbakir was the residence of the Chaldean Patriarch. The city of Diyarbakir extends across the feet of one of the Silver Ridge Towers mountain's branches on the right bank of the Tigris River. Fertile fields famous for their wheat, cottons and grape wines surround Diyarbakir. As the Ashurian and Urartian inscriptions reveal, the Urbikir was the center of the Bitsaman region, later becoming a part of ancient Assyria. In the second millennium before Christ, the Urbikir was first mentioned as Amidu, that is of Assyrian origin according to a legend. Diyarbakir is comparatively new name and comes from Arabic. From the times of Darius the first reign, the royal road passed through Amid Diyarbakir, connecting the east with the west. Historical accidents and disasters destroyed the fortress of the city, but during the Byzantine era, a new one was established, the standing walls which enfold the city's old districts. Tenarched bridge over the Tigris River still functions today, linking the city with the left bank regions.
There are around 50 replants, churches and mosques with impressive architectural styles. At the beginning of the 20th century, various Christian churches were functioning, such as Armenian Church of St. Serkis, St. Kyrakos with its seven altars, Syrian Orthodox Church of St. Duma, St. Stephan, St. John, St. Virgin Mary, Chaldean Churches of Pithion, St. Kyriakos, Chaldeni, and an Historian 4th century Church of St. Gevargis. Diyarbakir was surrounded with the Assyrian villages of Karabash, Kafarsu, Ain Tanur, and many others. Here is the church of Sun Virgin Mary, Mat Maria. The Syrian families gathered around this old Syrian Orthodox Church. They may have gone there along this narrow street, praying to the Lord and be seeking Him to guide and preserve their faithful nation. In October 1895, during the massacres organized by Turks, many Christians, including Assyrians, Armenians and Greeks, were hiding under these sacred arcs. Voices of grumble and displeasure were heard from the panic-stricken crowd. Take the Armenians out of the church to soothe the Turkish rage. And the pastor's response to it was the following. Those who cross themselves must stay in church till the end. If we are meant to die, then we shall die together. Over the years of massacres in the village of Diyarbakir, Large numbers of Assyrian and Armenian villages were destroyed. The local population was murdered by the Turkish regular army and Hamidiye soldiers. The Assyrian population of Urfa, Sivas, Marash and neighboring villages became the innocent victim of Abdul Hamid's slaughters. Bitlis. 
Bitlis is one of the unique cities of Western Armenia where the national breath and coloring is retained. The fortress of Baresh proudly looks at the city from the cliff. One art bridge over the Baresh river connects the districts that are spread along the hillsides with each other. Little has changed here. Neglected age-old tiled narrow streets, grape wines, private houses, enclosed with orchards and poplars. But as the evil from our childhood tales has drastically changed the owners of the city. Living for visitors only the goodness of the Creator. A kind of incorrectness and disharmony is perceptible here. We try to find our traces to the Syrian Orthodox Church. Here are the splinters of the abandoned shrine. Hardly keeping my emotions, I was searching for just a single inscription of a relic, but in vain. In the turn of the 20th century, there were estimated 30,000 inhabitants in Bitlis – Armenians, Assyrians, Turks, Kurds. Today, this road passing through the Bashkale city fortress takes us into the death of the powerful mountain of Hakiari to the land of the brave Assyrian Highlanders. The strategical significance of the road was enormous. In 1915, the city was occupied by the Russian forces. Kurdish invaders, Turkish askers and the soldiers of Hakiari have passed across this very street. The springs of the Great Zap river can be seen from here. Syrians, Jilus, were the dominant part of the Hakiari's population. According to historical resources, the Jilus surviving the Langtimur's invasions moved from northern Mesopotamia to find secure refuge in these unreachable mountains.
The right bank and left bank provinces of the grid Sap River, such as Upper and Lower Tiaris, Truma, Bas, Dis and Gilo, form the Syrian independent Malikuts or Ashurets of Hakiari. According to a tradition, the Ashurets were the part of a tribe union named the Assyrian Province. The religious and administrative leader, historian patriarch Mar Shimon, resided in the village of Kutchanis. These Malikuts survived until 1915. There were also so called semi independent tribes like Tal, Barvar, Levin, Julamerk. Barwar Rut, and dependent regions such as Gavar, Sarai, Amidiye, Shamizdin, and Al Bak. The region has often been considered a Kurdish populated area. But the historical studies point to the fact that the Assyrians here constituted 50% of the region's population, and due to the permanent and repeated attacks and persecution, the Assyrian ethnic territory has been diminished. For instance, the 1840 slaughters, organized by Kurd Badr Khan, abolished a large number of Assyrian villages and took nearly 10,000 Assyrian lives. Here is a ravishing village of the Gilos land, sheltered downhill the impregnable mountains. Here is a piece of the old humble church of Marshimun's flock, so alone, so abandoned and so violated. Every single tree here, every ruin, every river springing out from the mountains reminds us of the life and struggle of a believer, of a peaceful and diligent farmer, of a courageous soldier. The Nestorian churches of Hakeri were simple constructs without any opulence or artifice. The entrance of the church was built high and small in order to escape the abuse of the barbarians, who very often made efforts to enter the shrine on horseback. In every village of this land, even in a tiny village of a few pool hut, there was a church or a sacred place where the Peus Highlander praised the Lord, raising his prayers to him. According to prominent Armenian novelist Rafi, the Gilos were isolated from the outside world entirely concentrated within their country.
Gillo was famous for his impudent, explosive and quarrelsome character. But he was also courageous and kind at the same time. The mountains of Gilo are silent now. The brave Gilos are cut off their homeland. But even being miles away, deep in his heart, the Gilo bears a painful feeling, a longing for native mountains, for the mountains of Gilo. In the Ottoman Empire, nationality was determined by religion. The point of such a sly, foresighted policy was to disunite, then exterminate the Assyrian nation. According to this policy, there were no Assyrians in the Ottoman state, only Nestorians, Chaldeans and Jacobites. It's impossible today to give the exact number of the Assyrians living in the Ottoman Empire as the policy demanded reduction of the Christian numbers and increase of the Muslims. There have been always questions regarding accuracy in figures. As a rule, the statistics of the Christian people was conducted by their correspondingly clergymen. There were lots of places, though, where churches and pastors did not exist. The Christians lived together with the Muslim majority Thus, their numbers were disguised. But very often, the Christians themselves deliberately reduced their quantity in the hope of escaping Turkish attacks and heavy taxes. A systematic census of the empire usually was not carried out at all. The Russian deputy consul of the von Vilayet, that man, reported that to his knowledge there were 237 Assyrian families living in the Assyrian villages of Deir, Eli and Paki of the Hakiaris Gavar province. Official number showed only 77. There was a huge discrepancy between the actual and official numbers of the Christian population of Turkey. Most of the time, the Christians themselves intentionally diminished it. As a Russian researcher Sholkovnikov reported, in Asia and Turkey towards the beginning of the 20th century, the Assyrian people exceeded 860,000 in 130 dwellings places of the Urmia region in neighboring Persia they amounted to 100,000. There were 100,000 Assyrians living in the Van Vilayet. A great number of Assyrians lived in Antioch and in the territory of present-day Syria. We should take into consideration that the word Syria, 
which has always been Assyric in Armenian sources, is in fact the homeland of the Assyrians. Over time, they have been Islamized, becoming speakers of the Arabic language and have been assimilated into Arabs. There were Assyrian populated communities in the vilayets of Diyarbakir, Bitlis, Van. One of the most significant cultural and religious Assyrian centers was the Mosul vilayet. The population of the northern regions of Mosul, especially of the villages of Tzacho, Mosul, Peshhabur, consisted of mostly Chaldean Assyrians. The number of the Mosul Assyrian population totaled 100,000 to 150,000 people, which was a really high figure. There were Assyrian communities in the city of Urfa or Edessa. Many Assyrians lived together with Armenians in the city of Harbert, particularly in the southern part of the city. Here are the most important Assyrian centers, where an estimated one million Assyrians lived before 1914-1915, before the genocide. In different regions of the empire, two neighbor Christian nations, Assyrians and Armenians, lived peacefully side by side. Much can be said about sympathy and fraternal love between those two nations. When in 1914 the famous Armenian commander Andronik, together with his volunteers, came to defend the city of Sarai of the Van Vilayet, he was welcomed by the Assyrians. After the battles, the grateful Assyrians gave him a stallion named Aslan that later became his most faithful comrade in arms. In Harbert II, the Assyrians and the Armenians had a good relationship. Nearly 5,000 Assyrians inhabited the Sinomud district of Harbert and adjacent villages. Most of them spoke Armenian, and intermarriages between Assyrians and Armenians were common. Many Assyrians bore Armenian first names like Boros, Martyros or Hoanes. After the turn of the century, Ottoman Turkish territorial boundaries continued to shrink, despite the Sultan's previous warning to ethnic groups. Fearing the total collapse of the empire, a group of European educated Turks planned and executed a coup against the Sultan in 1908, then installed themselves at the helm of the empire. Though the new government had promised reforms that would give ethnic minorities greater rights, the young Turks, as they came to be called, failed to follow through. In fact, the ideology of their Committee of Union and Progress, Itihad Veteraki, was to keep the empire's territorial integrity. The young Turks started their Islamization policy, which they claimed did not suggest physical destruction of minority groups. Shortly after the coup, anti-Christian announcements were heard among the young Turks' leaders, particularly in the trio of upstarts Talat Pasha, Enver Pasha and Jemal Pasha. One Turkish ideologist, Nazim, once proclaimed that all non-Turkic elements, irrespective of their nationality, must be exterminated. Enver Pasha could not stand any more the presence of the Christians in the territory of Turkey. While the Turkish interior minister Talat Pasha was intended to make use of the First World War in order to finally punish the internal enemy, that is, the Christians. The 
the First World War burst out in 1914. Germany, Great Britain and Russian desired to redistribute the world in order to obtain more possessions. The Young Turks allied their empire with Germany and the Axis powers against the allies France, Britain and Russia. The allied states used the liberation movements of the ethnic minorities against Turkey considering themselves as defendants of minority groups living in the Ottoman Empire. Assyrians and Armenians, in turn, pinned liberation hopes on the allied states, supporting them in every possible way. Russia's deputy consul in Von Thermann, in his report to the Russian government, expressed hope that the Nestorian Assyrians would play an enormous role in the war against Turkey if they struggled for their release. Russia's expanded actions in this region did not please Britain at all. It was also eager to spread its influence there. All of this, of course, disturbed Turkey and its ally Germany. The Christian cooperation with Russia was another reason for Turkey to realizing its cherished plan. The Ottoman authorities following the Young Turks' order began to openly implement the program. The genocide appeared to be its logical consequence. In July 1914, the Ottoman government recruited the male Christian population between the ages of 20 to 45 to join labor battalions. Most of them, by adverse admission, were shot. Some, however, survived to return home to tell others how their friends were brutally killed. The massacres in the villages of Turabdin occurred openly and systematically. Both. Ottoman army and the Kurdish tribes carried out the acts of killings. Midiat had many old tunnels that connected the city with nearest Assyrian village of Ayn Wart. During the slaughters, they were served as hiding places. Ayn Wart village was famous for its courage and showed a heroic resistance to the butchers. In Turabdin, however, two villages could defend themselves and resist the Ottomans. The first village was Ayn Wardo, that lies seven kilometers to the east of Midyat. The people of this village could resist the Ottoman army and their allies, the Kurdish tribes. The second village was Hazakh, that lies between Midyat and Gziro, Jazire. Here, too, the Christians resisted the Ottoman army and its Kurdish allies and could defend themselves. When the Ottomans openly started the killings and the persecutions of the West Assyrians, Syrian Christian, in the region of Turabdin in Upper Mesopotamia, they used special tactics to reduce the fear of the Christians by telling them that the killings were directed at Armenians only. However, after they could suppress the Armenians, the Ottomans elaborated their tactics and told the heads of the Syrian Orthodox Church that they needed to suppress the Christian Protestants and Catholics under the pretext that all of this was related to America and France. The Ottomans pointed out that the Syrian Orthodox Christians were not supposed to be included in the wave of killings and suppressions. This way the Ottomans could get rid of the Christians one after another.
Here is the main thoroughfare of the long-standing city Hazan Cave. It's encircled with marvelous rock-cut dwellings. The name Hazan Cave derives from the Syrian phrase his sneaky pa, meaning rock fortress. Armenians and Assyrians have lived here for centuries. The Christian people of Hazan Cave, too, heard about the killings. To make sure that the rumors were true, they sent out five men to Midiad. After their arrival in Midiad, killings began in Hassan Cave. Those five men were miraculously saved. The latest mention of Assyrians living in Hassan Cave refers to 1978. There were 50 families in the city at that time. Thousands of Assyrians from Mardin, who survived the killings, tried to seek refuge in the French mission. But hundreds of them lost their lives because of hunger and diseases. Those who survived found shelters in foreign countries. In 1915, from May 10 to 30th, 1,200 Assyrians and Armenians from the Arbukir were arrested. Many of them were scheduled for deportation to Mosul, but later were plundered and thrown into the river from a cliff nearby the city. The gendarmes would stand along the either sides of the river and shoot them one after another. Here is the cliff and the river flowing peacefully below. They are the silent witness of bloody crimes. As the German secret bulletin reported later, 700 Christians between the ages of 16 to 70 were recruited, then shot dead during the road work. These are only smallest episodes from severe mass killings that were taking place in Western Armenian cities and villages. In Van, Sirt, Redwan, Bitlis, Mush, Urfa, Harbert, Adana, and in every Christian town and village. Towards the beginning of the 20th century, Van was encompassed with beautiful parks and gardens. It is situated on the shores of the Van Lake, in a valley 
enclosed by majestic mountains. The city is still controlled by Urartian era fortress with high oval fencings built on a cliff high over the valley. The famous Van suburb Aigestan, with its marvelous gardens, was situated right below the fortress. The city had an estimated 50,000 inhabitants, 30,000 of which were Armenians. In April 1915, the Turkish troops sieged the city. The heroic defense of Van began. Every resident of Van, including men, women and children, vowed to fight till the last drop of their blood. They had only one thought at that time, better to die than surrender. All of them were fighting with great patriotism and vigor. Along the Armenians were Assyrians from surrounding territories. The priest Kasha of the Assyrian populated village of Khno was hailed for his incredible valor and heroic death. There was also another Assyrian warrior named Sahak. Due to the 30-day resistance, one was spared. Unfortunately, the spirit of the one people was soon to be broken. They were forced to be taken from their homes, never to see them again. The Armenian monastery of Surbhach of Akhtamar Island. It stands today as a forlorn beauty, abandoned and so alone, dishonored and violated. Surbhach sent cross without the cross. In December 1914, with Russia's final retreat from Urmia, the local Assyrians left their homes behind and fled in their wakes. The region of Urmia, free of the Russian troops at that time, was gradually occupied by the Turkish military forces. The Ottoman invaders intended to abolish the Assyrian people not only in their country, but also in the territory of Persia. In January 1915, the Kurdish aggressors, furnished with Russian arms that were abandoned in Urmia, started their attacks on Assyrian villages of Urmia, putting all the inhabitants to the sword. During the Lajar's governance, once a year the Kurds from the upper villages would raid our villages and sack our properties. Each region had its own head. It was Sardars in Urmia and Kurd Aghas in Kurdish villages. But under Reza Shah rule, we were at peace.
For the Nestorian Assyrians, the only hope seemed to lie in Russian help. Help that had been promised so often, but had never been given. The Tsarist government had interest in the region and were trying to use this against its hostile enemy, Turkey. Russians urged the Highlander Assyrians to rebel against the Ottoman Empire in support of the Russian army. But in 1915, the Hakkaris jealous raised the rebellion and came to extermination. They didn't get the expected support from their ally. It brought disastrous consequences upon the desperate Assyrians. Their leader, Mar Shimon Benjamin, sent several letters and telegrams to the Russian Supreme Military Commander asking for help. I dare keep you informed that over a month our nation fights against the Kurdish and Turkish soldiers. They have captured and ruined our villages. The Assyrians have climbed up the mountains of Tiari, Tchumi and Dizi and are dying of hunger. We are surrounded by the enemy and are in a critical situation. For the sake of Christ, we beg you, send your troops here. All the villages of Hakiari were wiped out from the face of the earth. Armenians, too. Along with the Assyrians from Jula Merks, five villages were executed. The Assyrian nation was resisting under the leadership of the Patriarch. Many of them were martyred, others died of hunger, thirst and fatigue on the roads during the large-scale deportations. But a considerable part of them, with their leader Mor Shimun, crossed the Persian border finding a roof in the regions of Urmia and Salmast. Why is this tiny nation's patriarch pictured as a hero? Why is Mor Shimun Benjamin so much admired by Russian investigators after passing by this imperious mountains and being hosted by a patriarch. Why did the British and American missionaries remember and describe him in detail in their research? And why is this person so reverently enshrined in the hearts of his tribe's coming generation? More Shimon Benjamin Perhaps the renowned Armenian novelist Rafi was right to know that Mar Shimun example is an exception in the entire world of Christianity, where the spiritual father is a simple hero at the same time. Yes, he was a soldier and was murdered as a soldier. At that time, the Russian newspapers and magazines published much about the crimes implemented against Armenians and Assyrians. There were several accounts left by the missionaries. For instance, the heads of the Russian mission, the Bishop of Salmast and Supergan, would report in the Russian press how the villages were being plundered by the Turks and Kurds. Many were murdered, among them clergymen, the Metropolitan Mar Tuma Odu, and many others. What was that if not genocide when the Assyrian people were deprived of their homeland where they had been living for centuries? After the events of 1915, in the First World War, the Assyrians had lost their historical homeland. They were deported, scattered throughout the world, becoming immigrants forever. Assyrian communities formed in Russia, America and Europe. To a number of specialist judgment, Half a million of Assyrians were assassinated, including the Nestorians, Orthodox, Chaldeans and Protestants, as a result of the World War and the mass killing perpetrated by Turkish and Kurdish bands.
countless people massacred, and buried bodies left on the roads during deportation. Countless women raped, captured Christian beauties, imprisoned in Muslim harems. Countless people forcibly converted to Islam. Atrocities, deportations, violations. A flock of miserable, bleeding, starving, fever-riddled wretches, living skeletons who had not even strength enough to dodge the cudgels of their murderers. Through the angelic guise of this blue-eyed child, destiny speaks out. He swore on the Koran that his grandmother was Armenian. Who knows this little boy's history? Maybe his grandmother was one of those girls who were captured for the harems. Maybe his parents were forced to adopt Islam. How many of such Assyrian or Armenian fates are known today? We have very much documentation that has come out uh, very recently. Um, and it has to do with uh, the beatification process of uh, the Armenian Catholic Archbishop of Mardin, Ignaz Maloyan. Uh, he was declared a saint about three years ago. And during that beatification process, many documents written by uh, Catholic priests in Mardin were, came to life uh, after having been in archives for a long time. Um, there were three uh, French Dominican priests, uh, Jacques Retouret, a famous uh, a person in his day, uh, Beret or uh, Hyacinth Simon, who all wrote a chronicle of what was going on in Diyarbakir and Mardin area. Uh, also, there was a young fellow, um, Ishak Armalto, in the uh, Syrian Catholic monastery, who wrote a chronicle. And then a young fellow in the Dar es Zafaran uh, monastery, who was uh, Syrian Orthodox, also wrote uh, a contemporary study. Other type of material that is coming out is material from Turkish archives, from the military historical archives and from the uh, uh, Archive of the President. The Archive of the President gives us such things as orders for deportation of various groups. However, the Dominican priest that I were talking, was talking about, uh, especially Jacques Retorea, was very interested in actually getting a good um, statistics for all of the differing religious groups. Uh, now, this material is only for the Diyarbakir province, but he comes up then with proportions uh, of killings of, of Syrian Catholics and Armenian Catholics of over 80% had been lost during the period from April 1915 until November 1916 when he left Mardin for somewhere else. In 1915, the 1st Assyrian Regular Battalion, under the commandment of Patriarch Marshimun, 
joined the Russian army. Gradually they were becoming more experienced. They played a vital role in the struggle against the Turkish army and Kurdish hordes. In 1917 October, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia led to the definitive withdrawal of the Russian force. Taking advantage of Russia's temporary weakness, the Ottoman army attacked. Several battles took place between the Turks and Assyrians. In 1918, Marshimun went to the Kurdish fortress of Kiuna Shahar in Persia. With the advice of British Captain Grace to negotiate with the Kurds on further cooperation, the brave patriarch and all of his accompanying friends fell into the trap set by the false Kurds. In revenge of the blood incident, the commander of the Assyrian army, Agaputros, and his 7,000 courageous Highlanders shattered Chara, the den of the Kurdish brigands, in three days of perilous fighting. Over that time, ten thousand of Assyrians were slain in Urmia and its surroundings. As we know, the Assyrians of Julamark were urged by the Russian army in 1915 to start their liberation war against the Ottoman Empire under the leadership of their spiritual leader Marshimun Benjamin. But the Russian Empire did nothing to support its ally. The consequences were disastrous. There are numerous facts, telegrams where the Assyrians ask for Russian help. Horrible massacres began in Gavar. Thirty villages were entirely destroyed. In one of the telegrams it is said, 50,000 Assyrians will soon be killed unless you help us. Unfortunately, the help would never come. It was the Tsarist government fault that the greatest part of the Assyrians in the Van Dilayet were killed. Only a small part of them could flee to Urmia. I would like to bring a parallel between the Russia's 1914 withdrawal from Atrpatakan and the 1915 withdrawal from Van. In both cases, Armenians and Assyrians had great losses. The same thing happened to them in 1918, with the fault of the Great Britain, who had taken on the defendant's role of national minorities. In future, Armenians and Assyrians had to move from Western Armenia to Urmia to Hamadan and from there to Iraq, having enormous losses. Here, in Iraq, the British government again used the two nations for its dirty benefits. The story of ravages, slaughters and deportations can be continued. The losses and atrocities knew no limits. Over the period of the First World War, the Syrians were subjected to the genocide committed by the Ottoman government and lost two-thirds of its race. There is no doubt that genocide means mass destruction of a nation, but this is more than a mass destruction. According to the chart of the United Nations, adopted in December 1948, genocide means a deliberate act against any civilian population with intention to exterminate the nation's physical existence and culture. For the Syrians it was the very mass destruction and, of course, a deliberate extermination of the nation both physically and culturally. The same thing happened to the Armenians. A considerable population was forcibly deported, another part was entirely demolished by the Turks and Kurds. There are written documents of various authors, including the missionaries, particularly in Urmia, 
who even stayed in the first front line rather than leave the Assyrians. We have also British, French, Russian and German diplomatic and military sources. The Assyrian delegation, headed by the Nestorian Patriarch Mar Shimon Polus, the Chaldean Patriarch Joseph Emmanuel Thomas, attorneys Said Namek, Rustam Najib and Jean Zbouni, were invited to the Peace Congress in Paris in 1919. First they presented a program on building autonomy, then an independent state. Famous Assyrian figure Malik Yonan had meetings with Lloyd George, Clemenceau, and with other high-ranking officials. Unfortunately, the Assyrians gained nothing in Paris except disappointment. The same fate was awaiting them at the Sever Congress in 1920. Even in 1922-1923, at the Lausanne Conference, the Assyrian case put in the agenda by the League of Nations was condemned to failure. Today, Assyrians, together with Armenians, struggle against the ignorance of the genocide. Both nations have enriched the world civilization treasury with such historical pages every nation would be proud of. One of the world's ancient nations had huge losses during the years 1915 to 1918th. We must bow our heads before the hundreds of thousands of Assyrians' graves without tombstones, because neither the Armenians nor the Assyrians had tombstones on their graves. More than 700,000 Assyrians became victims of Turkish Yatalans. After the historical disasters and confusion, the remains of the Assyrian nation, disappointed and forsaken by everyone, were living in the new established Republic of Turkey in the cities of Diyarbakir, Mardin, Midiyat, and the surrounding villages and regions. Living in these poor areas away from the central parts of Turkey, they were hidden and thus protected. They had an opportunity to survive, keep the language and traditions, go to their churches. But the memories of the blood events were still fresh. According to some historical documents, there are a couple of thousand of half Kurd Assyrians and Armenians of Hakiari who do not speak their native languages, though some of them speak in secret. The turkey cypriot conflict that arose in the 1970s revived the fear of another genocide. The Assyrians in Turkey fled their homes for foreign countries. I think the immediate, the immediate reasons were that they became afraid of uh, a kind of anti-Christian uh, ideology that resurged at the time, at the time of the Cyprus conflict. Um, that, that was one important reason uh, th that the Cyprus conflict was interpreted as, as a, a war between Muslims and Christians, uh, and it was very acute, it was very near, and it involved, it, 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 it involved uh, Christians uh, within the Turkish Republic uh, in, uh, in, in a very immediate way. So many of them 
were afraid that this is the beginning of a new genocide. Of, uh, so, so many of them felt that uh, the, 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 the faster we can get away from her, the better it is. Uh, so there was really a kind of, uh, a kind of uh, uh, wave out where one family left uh, and dragged with it other related families. قاموا أخنن أختي أخنن هرب بيشخ مخن خراي قاموا ناشن أختي ناشن بخينا قريباي قاموا ألمن أختي ألمن بوينا يخسراي وقاموا شمن أختي شمن بقرايونا أطراي قاموا قاموا تيول بسراوي لا حقيات ناشناي قامو دنيا شخلو بيل الزد قديا تاريخاي قامو كتاوت بصمونينا كم شمهيلا باربراي قامو ديوي بجلاجينا سهدواتا امتناي قامو اخنن اختي اخنن هربت بيشخ مخنخراي ازقدتوتا ادقاتوراي كلمة the descendants of the widespread Assyrians continue their just struggle for the recognition of historical injustice and re-establishment of their trampled rights. Various historical archive documents and research papers are being studied and published to keep the world aware of the real picture of the greatest crime against humanity, the first genocide of the 20th century. The last eight years we have been working a lot about giving a lot of information, giving a lot of uh, documentation about the genocide of the Assyrians. Um, the Armenians have been working on this genocide for much longer time and my experience as a uh, politician here in Europe, uh, we see that a lot of politicians in Europe do know about the genocide of the Armenians but don't know anything about the genocide on the Assyrians. During the last eight years, um, we have been doing a lot of political work to make the European politicians aware about the genocide of the Assyrians. And especially now Turkey want to be member of the European Parliament. And we think as uh, Assyrian uh, people who work on this question is that the uh, 15 years we will get uh, until Turkey will be member of the European Parliament, yes or not, during this time we have to work very hard and very careful with the Armenians together to get the recognition of the Assyrian and Armenian genocide. And if we don't uh, close this part of the history, I think the generations of my age and the common generation we will still be, um, uh, I, I call it, uh, a traumatically uh, experience from their parents and they will live with this traumatically genocide history. In my view, the most important and sig significant uh, point in this whole uh, genocide question is the recognition of the genocide in the European Parliament and the recognition of the genocide on the Assyrians uh, from the Turkish government. One of the most significant human efforts is aspiration to morality. Our inner stability and even existence is regulated by it. It is the morality of our deeds that adds beauty and dignity to our life. With Einstein's words, we can evaluate and define nation's role and mission underneath the sky. Time has an incredibly ability to erase everything from human recollection and sink the evil and goodness into oblivion. But there is a kind of recollection in the corners of which the moral echoes of our deeds are being collected. Is the reminiscence of the soul. History is unchangeable essence with its numerous pages, where the facts are being recorded and never pass into forgiveness. History is an unchangeable essence with its numberless pages, 
where the facts are being recorded and never pass into forgetfulness. There is a page in that very essence that cannot even be forgotten, an unforgotten page of one nation. In the end of the 19th and the beginning of 20th centuries, in the territory of Ottoman Empire, hundreds of thousands of Assyrians have been subjected to genocide. <laughs> 